Hey everyone, it's Ron Johnson and this is the Ron Johnson Show. It's the final Vikings show as far as the season goes. We're going to talk football for the rest of the year. I mean, there's a Super Bowl, there's playoffs. We got to talk about these other teams and we got to see what the Giants do in this next game because if the Giants win, of course everybody's going to say, man, that should have been the Vikings. But we got to talk about this Vikings game. We're going to break it down to you. And, and there's something I want you to stick around for because I had a long time to watch that fourth down play. But there's a third down play before that as well that we're going to talk about. And then just the overall scene of the stadium. I mean, it was truly a movie. I know Cam Bynum has brought that up. But the number of stars that showed out for the Vikings-Giants game, some you would expect, some ain't expected. Stay tuned for that on the Ron Johnson Show. Locked on Sports Minnesota Podcast. It's endless Minnesota Vikings talk with the diverse voices of your local experts. Now the Ron Johnson Show. On the field, in the broadcast booth, Ron Johnson is Minnesota sports. He's played with them, hung out with them, and grown up with all the big names in Minnesota sports. They're hanging out with Ron Johnson. It's the Ron Johnson Show on the Locked On Sports Minnesota podcast. And it starts now. Welcome to the Ron Johnson and show. And if you're like me, you were up late for this Vikings game. Now, some of you got to leave early, but I had to stay and do the post game show. I had to finish the season out on a strong note. And I think we went out on a pretty strong note, took some calls from some people and the overarching theme on the post game was Ed Donatel. And I get it. I get everybody's concern, but I do have a theory personally. Um, and and my, my my whether he stays or goes, I don't care. I really don't care. But I do have an overarching kind of theme, I think, of the season. And I want you guys to remember this going into the offseason of what I felt like this defense was. Now, the offense, it was a Lamborghini. It was a Lamborghini. But it was a Lamborghini parked next to um, – I don't even know what kind of car we parked next to. But it was parked next to a car that was really good. So let's just call it the Cadillac like Escalade. But it had the tires of like a worn down 1980 like Toyota Corolla's tires. So like it took the tires from that old car and tried to put it on this brand new Cadillac like Escalade that had all the, the pieces to the puzzle, looked strong and big, but it can't get through the snow. Not with those tires. And I, and I think that was the theme for this Viking scene. But before we jump into this, I want to set the scene. I want to set the scene for what, a uh, NFL playoff game really was like, and it was the New York Giants. We know the New York Giants have stars. We know the Minnesota Vikings, uh, Minnesota as a state has stars. But there were some unexpected ones in the building, and we're going to set that scene. But before we do, and before I bring Sam Ekstrom in, I want you guys to remember, please download the Amazon Fire and Roku apps. You can just search on your Amazon Fire or your Roku tablet or your device, your TV, whatever you have. Search Locked On Sports Minnesota. That's Locked On Sports Minnesota. Download the app. You can get all of our videos, all of our shows, and up-to-date press conferences. Any videos we have launched, they'll be right there on your screen or on your device. Well, as I bring Sam Ekstrom into the show, <clears throat> my producer, Sam, we got to talk about this. But I want to mm -hmm. set the scene. So walk yeah. into the building, you know, a nice afternoon, had a great breakfast with the family, um, and then right away hit with a star. As I'm walking through um, the Vikings entrance, because we we get to go through the Vikings entrance, um, and so as I'm walking through the Vikings entrance, I'm standing right there with AP. Adrian Peterson is standing there right next to me. And so as I'm talking to Adrian Peterson, um, you know, just asking him about, you know, I knew why he was there. I had already kind of been told, but I didn't want to put too much information out there unless it was out there already by himself. Uh, but the Vikings kind of let us know some of the, the people that were going to be in the building. Some they didn't know were going to be in the building because they were last minute ads. Uh, but then there's Agent Peterson to start out the day. And then as I walk up the escalator, uh, I see Robert Griffith. Robert Griffith Gr Griffith came on our pregame show. I played against Rob when he was with the Browns. I was with the Ravens. I, I, I'm getting my MBA at Fordham. Uh, Robert Griffith was my classmate. You know, he was in our classes before COVID hit. Um, and he's there. And then all of a sudden I see Johnny Randall. And then I see uh, a friend of the show in Chuck Foreman. So you got your usual suspects. But then... Show ends. I go down to the field. I see Drew Brees. 
why is Drew Brees in Minnesota? Neither team has Drew Brees. Well, then I found out his son is a huge Justin Jefferson fan. So it was actually cool interaction cool. to watch Drew Brees uh, be a dad because he's literally like, you know, and then Drew and I are talking and I'm telling him, you know, like Tony Dungy is my god, blah, blah, blah. And he's like, oh, yeah, I forgot about that. And and Drew, I, you know, I reminded him that, hey, man, you spoke to us for the, hey, you're in the NFL uh, top 32 rookies that got flown out to San Diego to hang out in California. And then we got taken over to uh, Pasadena to do the uh, Rose Bowl Stadium. And uh, Drew was there. And so uh, we we relived that. We relived some of the Purdue, Minnesota days for a little bit. And then here comes Ben Lieber, which, of course, I have that picture. I have to tweet it out at some point. And for those listening on the podcast, if you go to YouTube uh, and watch the show, you'll be able to see some of these pictures as, as they're uh, loaded up as I'm talking. But Drew Brees... Uh, ben Lieber. So I'm making jokes about the uh, pass interference. Everybody knows from 2009. Uh, and then here comes Adrian Peterson and Drew Brees. Uh, so it's just, it was so much going on on the sideline. And then you look over, there's Anthony Edwards. And uh, Anthony Edwards, I mean, he's legit 6'5", 6'6". So, you know, talking to him about football, we didn't even talk basketball. Like, I didn't talk locked on sports, basketball, and Timberwolves. No, one, I did give him what I said. I said, look, I feel like you are truly a guy they can take over a game at any point. I was like, you are a guy that needs to take over a game at any point. He was like, he agreed. He knows. He's like, yeah, I know. I know. I got to figure this out. Like, he knows that he needs to do it, but he also knows he has teammates and stars to defer to. You see D'Angelo Russell making tweets about, hey, you either love me now or you're going to lose me. Like, what is going on with that? Uh, <laughs> so clearly there's some consternation within their organization about who should be the guy. And then I fast forward again. I, I Roger Goodell walks by, gives me a big hug because, you know, he knew about my dad and blah, blah. But then also Roger was the commissioner when I was drafted and he was a part of the organization. And so, uh, you know, he he did the Hey Rookie stuff and he knows all that. So he's a he's a great with faces and names. So he comes over, uh, introduced me to his wife. His daughter is a big Adam Thielen fan. So then I get to do my Adam Thielen thing because I'm standing next to Adam Thielen's wife. I'm like, hey. It's Roger Goodell's daughter. It's her birthday. She's a huge Adam Thielen fan. Um, so, you know, she makes the connection for Adam. Of course, the daughter is too scared to say something. Adam finally comes over to us uh, and she's super shy. So she kind of walks off. <laughs> Starstruck. Starstruck. We did all that work to get Adam Thielen to come over there and introduce her to his wife. And, you know, hey, he, she's a huge Adam Thielen fan in New York. They live in New York. So, you know, that didn't go over well. You know, he, she's showing up in a Vikings jersey to school in New York. Hey, but she's a she's a true fan true, uh, through and through for, for Adam. Um, but, you know, it was just so many, you know, you got ludicrous in the building. And so for Vikings fans, I understand what you didn't see on TV. One, it was a movie type scene. And then the movie started and the game went and it went the way we thought. We knew it was going to be close. Uh, we knew everything was going to happen the way they said it was going to happen. We thought it would come down to a last minute drive for the Vikings to win. Kevin O'Connell is going to go from two. I saw, I think you tweeted, that's what some other people tweet that Vikings are going to score here. Kevin O'Connell is going to go for two. They're going to either win or lose going for two. And then the movie is written. Didn't happen. And Sam, I'll, I'll start here because we're going to, we're going to really break this down uh, in the second segment. Uh, so please stick around for the second segment. People, we're going to really get into this game, but Sam, when you look at this over the, the season as a whole, do you feel like it was a good or bad start to Kevin O'Connell's career? So I am stealing this take a little bit from Arif Hassan. Okay. But I like it. I think it's a little bit like Rams 2017. That's the first McVay season where the offense was unbelievable. Mm hmm. Um, th it was clear they had something there and then they lost in the first round. They got beat by the Falcons. Falcons came into their building and beat them on the road. Mm. Kind of felt that way, right? Like a young, a young offensive minded coach comes in, revolutionizes the culture, revolutionizes the offense, but they didn't quite have it all together yet. And then the next year, if you remember, they're in the Super Bowl. <laughs> so... I think that's that's what you hang your hat on, right? Is that this is the start of the KOC era and that this is just the building block. Now, I think I think it's a tough roster situation to build upon. Mm -hmm. Um I think you could though you can look at a lot of elements that were successful. Kirk Cousins becoming a reliable quarterback in the fourth quarter. Mm -hmm. Justin Jefferson becoming an international almost phenomenon and i think solidifying his place in minnesota like if anyone was worried about 
him getting disgruntled, you know, wanting out of this situation. I don't think that's happening. I think he is entrenched as a Viking for a long time, and I think the Vikings are going to pay him accordingly. Um, I just think that the the pieces in place on this offense are going to keep this team competitive for a while. The defense, we got plenty to talk about. But I, I think that there's a lot in place for this Vikings team going forward. And I'm going to... I'm always going to talk about the Buffalo game. I'm mm-hmm. always going to talk about the Colts game. Uh, I'm always going to talk about the 61-yard field goal. And I think that if you can't hang on to those moments, uh, if you think it's a complete failure because they didn't win a playoff game, mm-hmm. that, that's an unfortunate way to look at it. It is yeah. a very disappointing way to go out. Don't get me wrong. Yeah. Um, and Yeah, lot, a lot to appreciate as well. No, and I was going to say, like, for the people that are, like, because I see people tweeting, so last year the Packers went and the Vikings didn't, and the Vikings fans were kind of on the Packers when they lost. And all you see is, like, tweets about, like, oh, only losers tweet about winners that are in the playoffs here at home. And then what happens this season to Packers fans? They're doing the same exact thing. Players and fans and media members that really, really love the Packers, they're all doing the same exact thing. I personally didn't care when the Packers lost or won last year like it doesn't matter to me um like when you think about that i think that's the other thing that happened is like you saw all these packers players you know tweeting bakhtiari and all oh, you love to see it like hey yeah they beat you you beat us but we're in the playoffs you're not why are you mad uh you see the media members oh yep that's exactly what i thought like if they are what you thought they were they beat you you beat them they beat you so what does that mean they're in the playoffs you're not they won 11 games that were one score games. My overarching thing before we jump into the next segment, mm-hmm. and I said this, I feel like this defense, so the offense, I agree with you, like high powered, uh, had all the weapons. I think Kevin O'Connell is working towards, uh, and not Sean McVay, I want him to work towards Chicago Sh- Shanahan. Like Sean McVay's feels like it's a boomer bust based on Cooper Cup. Like that's what it felt like. Uh, without Cooper Cup, without Matthew Stafford, he couldn't go. But the 49ers, without Debo, without any quarterback, like they are still like Trey Lance, Jimmy Garoppolo, and now Brock Purdy, they're still moving forward. They are still are really good. And that's where I hope Kevin O'Connell starts to look and say, you know what? McVay had holes. We did win the Super Bowl because of Matthew Stafford, lightning in the bottle, Cooper Cup. But can we be sustainable? Now, the 49ers haven't won one, but they're constantly always – right back in it and they're constantly rebuilding quick and then they're right back in it the one thing i the, my, my theme for this defense is square peg round hole i feel like this three four defense was a round hole and i feel like all these players were square pegs and they were trying to plug now this is why i say this if you're really really good at, at your job as a kid you eventually can find a way to get a square peg through a round hole now you might break the, the the hole a little bit you might like wear down the, the edges on your square i don't know <laughs> but eventually you can get some in and, and and when you look at that that's the harrison smiths that's the the the, the cam bynums the patrick petersons the eric kendricks the zadarius smiths but then the daniel hunter to me is an extremely strong big square peg and that round hole was only going to work once or twice and it did like when he was able to put his hand in the ground he would get home but throughout the whole season, there was a lot of edge contained loss. Uh, there was a lot of confusion on who should be covering the flat. Him chasing guys on crossing routes, not his thing. No. Um, that's that's where I look at where you look at the draft and, and you go back to that and you think about the Packers got an outside linebacker by the name of Quay Walker. Vikings could have easily used him knowing they were going to be in the 3-4. Like that's the little things where I'm like, you can never have enough outside linebackers in the 3-4. Because when you go nickel or when you go passing situations, you bring all those backers in. You bring the DJ Wandoms in with the Zadarius Smiths and the Daniel Hunters. Why not just have Quay Walker? Now he's a true defensive end, or sorry, outside linebacker in a 3-4 defense. And you could put Daniel at, at the five technique and then have a, 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 a cock nose with a D tackle. Like there's a lot you can do. And then you have those backers kind of really protect that gap where Daniel has avoided because he's not a true three. He's more of a five or you make him stronger, bigger, or you can't get much stronger than him, but you let him get a little bit bigger saying, Hey, you're not a, you're not a true defense in, you're going to be more of a, of a three, five technique taking on more head on block. So feel free to bulk up a little bit. Like there's, there's, there's things I think they could have got done. Cause I think he could be a violent, like I, like you look at Daniel or uh, Aaron Donald, mm-hmm. 
I feel like Daniel Hunter can easily be Aaron Donald. I feel like he easily can be a three technique. They can just be violent and just say, go after the quarterback every time, stop the run, hold up two guys. Like, I, now I don't know if his body, and that's the thing, I don't know if his body and his neck and everything he's been through could sustain that because that's a lot of banging in there when you move to three versus being an outside backer. But at the end of the day, again, square peg, round hole, I feel like that was the defense, offense, super, super dynamic. Uh, but people, don't forget the moment. Sam bought him up. The Buffalo Bills game, history. The Colts game, history. And when I say history, I mean one of the greatest catches in NFL history for the Buffalo game. Coach, we know that comeback is history. We got the longest field goal in Vikings history at 61 yards and to win a game. I mean, there's so much that happened to this team. Uh, 11 wins by one score. They always kept you in this game. They always kept you tied to your TV. Don't forget that. Because this is a game. This is a game of football. Yes, these guys make a ton of money. Yes, this is their living, their livelihood. But it's a game. Enjoy it. Don't let it ruin your day. Don't let it ruin your offseason. Don't let it ruin your family vacation. They lost. Don't go burn a jersey you spent $200 on. Don't go throw the hoodie away that you put. I'm wearing these Unreal hoodies all the time. I don't care. I'm wearing it in February. I'm wearing it in March. I'm wearing it on the airplane. Yeah. I don't care. It's a good hoodie. I'm not I'm not playing that game. I'm not looking for guys to lose their jobs and get fired. I really feel like the problem, and we'll bring this up uh later this week. They only have four draft picks in the first round, Sam. I mean, sorry, four draft picks overall. So they're gonna have to get rid of some guys and make some trades to get some draft picks. Whether it's dropping back in rounds and loading up and then trying to like I don't think you can do that. You can't bank on a bunch of fourth and fifth and sixth round guys to come help you out. You got to get some some second and thirds. So I can see them dropping back in the second and third to get a couple second and thirds maybe. But they're going to have to trade some guys. They're going to have to trade some guys with some value that are going to be cap casualties anyway and get some draft picks back. I mean, I hate to say this, between Adam Thielen, Dalvin Cook, Daniil Hunter, um, you can probably get a first or a second out of, you know, for those guys. Even maybe multiples. So there's going to be there's going to be a lot of movement this offseason. But it's not here yet. We got to move on. We're going to come back. We're going to talk a lot about this in a second. So I want to break down this play because that fourth and eight and then third and eight, there were some things that could have happened in those plays. I've watched it a couple of times. Uh, at some point, maybe we'll do a Ron Johnson show film study where we just put up five to 10 minutes of film study where I'm just going to go over that play and some other plays that I think were crucial mm -hmm. from that game. Um, but it, we have to talk about it. It's one of those things you have to do it. You put it to bed. We're going to talk about all season. We're going to people are going to be mad about it. We're going to I guarantee up until the draft. We're still going to go back to that. Like, man, if they had this, if they just had a, a better pass protection in that play. And maybe they win that game. Maybe think about the Buffalo Bills game. He had time. He got the ball. Justin Jefferson on fourth and 18. Yep. He didn't have time this game. And it was it was easily could have been blocked because of where he came from and where he ended up. So we'll talk about that next on the Ron Johnson show. But remember, check out our Locked On Sports Minnesota podcast on YouTube. Following every Twins, Vikings, Wild, or Wolves game, our Locked On team hosts are broadcasting live with Team Insiders. Never miss a podcast by subscribing to Locked On Sports Minnesota on YouTube. We have a word from our sponsors. It's a sad day. There's no more Bet Online Vikings lines to update you on. But BetOnline.net remains your number one source for all the NFL playoff odds tonight. Cowboys Buccaneers, Cowboys two and a half point favorites on the road in Tampa. I'm seeing Giants seven point underdogs next week at Philly. Get all that and more NBA, NHL, UFC lines at betonline.net. They're also your home for good sports podcasts, analyzing the latest trends in sports. It's Bet Online. Find it on your mobile device today. Bet Online, where the game starts. Well, Sam, the overarching theme from this game was just not enough. Just not enough. There wasn't enough blocking. There wasn't enough big plays. There wasn't, wasn't enough haymakers. There wasn't enough coverage on defense. Uh, there wasn't enough pressure on Daniel Jones. And you know what? There wasn't enough on the third and eight and the fourth and eight from a variety of people. And I'm going to lay it out like this. You can't blame uh, Kirk Cousins. You can't. You can't blame Kirk Cousins for this. Uh, this is not Kirk Cousins' fault. Uh, Kirk Cousins just played the hand he was dealt. And for anybody who's played poker, sometimes you just got to you gotta bluff and you got to go all in, and you might not have a lot on the table. And in that moment, the fourth down, so let's start with the fourth down. Fourth and eight, 
You got a bunch left. I can I, I don't even have to look at the play. I can remember it like it was yesterday. You got a bunch left with two tight receivers, and you got Justin Jefferson to the right, and you also have uh, TJ Hawkinson. Now, here's the problem, my thought in the first part of this. I love the twist. So you got Adam Thielen twisting. You got KJ Osborne coming underneath. So they're trying to get some kind of confusion just in case they're in man coverage, which they were. The biggest issue with Thielen is if it's fourth and eight, I would have spent less time trying to get past the guy as far as like just running off the line and not giving him anything. I would have had some kind of like stutter and then go. So meaning when he releases, he's going to release like he's running because there was nobody to his left, meaning he could have faked like he's going to run an out route right at the sticks. Because if I'm a coach, they put a blitz on hoping like get there, get there because we we're we're banking on they're going for the sticks because you don't need a touchdown you just need to get to the sticks i would have run some kind of route like right at like six to seven yards to make them think i'm running a speed out that's one two you theoretically with the way they were covering them inside out so his db was inside he could have run a quick bender at seven yards and faded back to eight yards kirk cousins throws it on a quick three adam thielen's the ball that's one way K.J. Osborne, we know he had the over. He was coming open, open late. Kirk Cousins didn't have time to get him the ball. You got Justin Jefferson on kind of a, a, a corner route, uh, taking it high. Same thing there. Um, it, they are double covering him. They do have a high safety with that. So they bracketed Justin Jefferson with the high safety. So honestly, he's probably dead because everybody's like, oh, Kirk Cousins just heaved it down there and hope for the best. He's probably dead. Like they're like, look. We got a safety high, so if it's a high ball, he can make it over there in time to knock it down. I got two guys covering him for the inside and outside. My guy in that play would have been TJ Hawkinson. He had man coverage. I know he had a three-yard route, but the problem is he releases late, so he kind of hesitates as if, okay, just in case I need to block, I'm going to block, and then I'm going to release. So it was a it was like a half a second delay release. I'm going to get him out into the route early. I'm going to run him on a choice route, meaning if that guy's over the top right, he has a, a, a slant. If that guy's over the top inside, he has a deep out at about eight yards. That would have been my personal opinion on that play. There's no reason for anybody to be an outlet. Now, I get the Dalvin Cook uh, or whoever the running back was because he was blocking and then released Dalvin. out. Yep. But the tight end in that situation, there was no reason for him not to be eight yards down the field already or working towards it where he kind of gets up on the guy, nods the out route like he did earlier, and then bends around for that one play that came wide open. We all remember that big play where – he ran the out and then bubbled around. I forgot what that play is called because uh, we used to run that with the Bears when I played tight end. But you run it out and then up. And so, but you run it out and you kind of, it's like a bender. And you bend it back around the back of the linebacker covering you because linebackers go for those double moves because they always just think, okay, my my guy, I, I got hooked flat. My guy ran out, so I'm just going to kind of fade and hope he throws it. And the guy faded like to try to get under the throw and he came right behind him. Perfect play call by Kevin O'Connell. He could have literally done that again in that situation because it was there. So in the end, I just feel like that was a little bit there on the play call, less on Kirk Cousins. Now the offensive line, uh, DeMarcus or Dexter Lawrence, he's lined up over the center kind of, and he loops around to the guard. I don't see why the center didn't help and double team him. Those are kind of my takeaways, quick twitch from that fourth and eight, and then we'll get into that third and eight play. But those are my fourth and eight quick twitch thoughts. What are, what are your thoughts on it? All right. Kirk Cousins was amazing all game, and I'm not taking that away from him. Mm -hmm. I just don't get why your eyes would even go underneath. Like the purpose of those routes, Ron, correct me if I'm wrong. The mm -hmm. purpose of those routes is to make sure the coverage stays close to the line of scrimmage so that space gets created in the middle of the field. Mm -hmm. You don't want everybody going deep and having every defensive back in the middle of the field. You're trying to keep some guys close to the line. So there's space for guys like Osborne. Mm -hmm. um, I just, I don't get why that would even be an option on the play. And as, and I know Kirk said after the game, well, we had some yak earlier in the game on third downs where, where Hawkinson got there. But in that situation, when it's season on the line, I don't think you have that option. So I, I think, number one, that needs to be off the table. I think Osborne was the play. It was right in Cousins' line of vision, over the middle. He was going to cut open. And even if he's not looking, you got to have a trust throw. you got to put that ball in play beyond the sticks. As Kirk has done a lot of times this year, Ron, this isn't an unusual situation for Kirk to have to throw it up to somebody. He did it to Justin in Buffalo. 
Right. Um, but I also wish he might have had a little better pocket presence. And, and, you know, we saw Daniel Jones do this all day where he just knows so quickly where he needs to go to find that open space. Mm-hmm. Um, and Kirk didn't even try to to escape that. Maybe that's asking a little too much of him, but I didn't like the decision. Um, and and I think I like I like your approach, Ron, kind of talking about the play call. Maybe it wasn't a play call that really, you know, made it easy on Kirk because he couldn't afford any pressure up the middle on that play call because the routes right. were pretty long developing downfield. So maybe that's a, a KOC issue. Um, but I also wouldn't have made the throw. And that's not taking away from a great Kirk game. The defense was horrible. Uh, and Kirk was wonderful all day. It's really unfortunate that he has to go out that way. Mm-hmm. on a play that people are going to talk about and, and dissect now for the next eight months. And, and I, and I always, I'm a big devil's advocate guy. Like I can debate either side. If I go into debate class and they say, Hey, debate this, I'm going to debate it. Sky is blue, debate it. Sky is orange. Now defend it. I can do both. So I'm going to go the other side of this for me to say that is for me to not know what defense are going to be called for Kevin O'Connell. He's playing chess. So he's probably thinking the same thing. They're going to call a defense to, guard the sticks so why would i run routes to the sticks so i do understand thinking like you know what if they are playing some sticks kind of coverage um where you look at like the dolphins when they went zero coverage early the blitz didn't get there and then stefan diggs kills Xavier howard i watched uh darius slay tweet about that and then kirk warner reiterated it you are expecting coverage to get or the pressure to get there so Yes, I'm going to sit and kind of catch him at eight yards. That's what Kevin O'Connell was hoping for. Like, they were going to try to sit and catch him at the sticks. Boom, just run by him. Because if they're sitting there, run by him. Now, the problem, though, you can't just run by him uh, because they're just as fast as you. You have to give nods or sticks or whatever. And that's that's why I look at that. I look at the other side of that is Kevin O'Connell's playing chess, uh, not checkers, thinking, well, they're thinking sticks, so let me not do sticks. The only, only question mark route I had, honestly, is really TJ Hawkinson. I yeah. felt like he should have had some kind of in-breaking route or some kind of out-breaking route, but at eight, like seven yards where he can catch it and fall forward uh, to get the play or just go eight yards. Get to the sticks. Mm-hmm. Let your momentum. You're big. You've been killing them all day. Uh, stick the ball out and then pull it back. Let the refs give it to you, whatever. But here's another one for me, Sam. Third and eight, I saw this tweet. Um, I think it was Brandon Warren maybe even. But I saw this tweet or somebody, maybe Will or Gotts. But – the video of the third and eight play. They're saying Kirk Cousins should have led KJ Osborne on the over route. Agreed, he should have. But here's the problem with that route, too. Both him and I think it was Justin Jefferson, they just ran overs and didn't give any kind of nothing. Like we always were taught to stair step, which means take a step like you're on stairs and then go again. So stair step, make it look like a stair. Literally, when you draw it, it looks like a stair. Because people are like, what is, why are you calling it a stair step? Because when you draw it on the thing it looks like a stair like mm-hmm. that's that's what it was like we had a route called florida and we had a route called memphis they look like an m and one looked like an f it was one in here and then one in there it looked like an f so that was from the Colts. so a lot of times routes and stuff that people do in the field are literally uh because somebody like I, I did my daughter's basketball team the other day and i taught them the triangle offense <laughs> and i was trying to show them shapes and i'm like get into a square and they got to a square i'm like now pass the ball around I was like, and point guard, you stand at the top. I'm like, now get into a triangle. I'm like, point guard, dribble over and, and pass it between the two girls. And so I'm teaching them a triangle offense. And so I'm like, football's the same way. They use letters. They use shapes. Uh, stair step. KJ Osborne just ran an over route. One, when you're running an over, you never want to just fade back because you're allowing the DB to undercut you because he's running a, a shorter plane. You want to keep working back towards the quarterback so that you keep your distance the same from a DB working back because he's working under two Mm -hmm. to try to pick it off. Kirk Cousins, when you fade, you no longer are running across my face. As you run this way, if you fade, to me it looks like you're running there. So Kirk is throwing it as if KJ Osborne is going that way and not that way. And for those at, at home, you can't hear what I'm doing. I'm using hand signals, and that's terrible. But basically think about somebody running left or right versus somebody running a little bit more diagonal. KJ Osborne's running a little bit more diagonal, and so Kirk makes the throw as if it's a diagonal route where he should have been running across. That's the first side of it because he would have kept separation. It would have been a clear 
separation. But if he even stair steps in the middle of the field to make the DB think, because people are like, oh, well, the DB can see the over route. He can't see the second over route. He's not looking at that. He's looking at KJ. He's running for his life, trying to keep up. If KJ makes it, because because uh, Kevin O'Connell has it in his office when he runs the over and then the back to the corner. If KJ fakes like he's going to do that and then run over, he's probably wide open on third and eight. And we're not even talking about fourth and eight. So again, they're going to break down this film. And there's a lot of moments in this game like that where those guys are going to watch it back and be like, dang, you're right. I should have done that. Because these are pros. These guys are good at their job. They've done this before. Um, but even the third and eight, like that, that was a great play call. That was a great design. But there's one piece of that. I always heard the old adage, uh, and, and I get this from, it's not an old adage. It's, I don't even know where it came from. But it was from Fast and Furious, Tokyo Drift. I know you've never seen that, Sam. Right, but the uh, the the old grandpa tells his son a story because he was with the uh, the yakuza, which was a gang uh, and mafia in uh, China, and so he's explaining to him about that. Um, he's like, "But grandpa, he only stole, you know, whatever it was a thousand dollars." He's like, "Yeah, but think about this: there was a horse maker, or sorry, horseshoe maker that did not get one of the horseshoes on his horse's foot." He thought it was okay. He never told the guy the horse the horse didn't have four horseshoes on. He's like, because of that, the war was lost. And he's like, please explain. Of course, he goes on, he explains it. He's like, because he didn't get the one horseshoe on, he had three horseshoes, he ended up steps, he steps on the nail on his way, hurts his foot, horse can't keep going. Well, that horse was giving to the guy who had the note that was supposed to get that to the general on the other side of the town uh, to be able, or whatever, other side of the war to explain to him what was supposed to happen. Because he didn't get that letter. He didn't get his troops set up the right way. Boom. They were overtaken. They lost the war. And he's like, you can't say something that small didn't affect the war. Here's another small moment. And I'll, and you tell me while you're thinking about it, if you can think of a small moment. Irv Smith Jr. Irv Smith Jr. Yes, he caught a touchdown. He had one catch for three yards and a touchdown. Mm -hmm. Danced as if, like. He just had the greatest game of his life. I don't understand that part of the, the like if I if I have a bad play and I make a good play, I don't know if I'm gonna over celebrate like that. Like it's yeah. almost it's always a too much, like you know, going through warm-ups, shirt up completely, stomach all out. Like I it's too much a look at me, look at me, you know, like I just don't understand that. But I know Irv Smith can catch the ball because he does it. That was a moment of like trying to run before you had the ball, not securing the catch. If they get that first down and they convert there. They probably continue on in that drive. The yep. crowd probably is in the game. The confidence level of this team is probably there. I feel like that little moment changed the scope of the whole game. It changed the, the feeling of the crowd. People in the press box were laughing because they're like classic Vikings and Irv Smith. I mean, it just changed the scope of the whole day. The Giants were able to take the lead, and then the Vikings had to play catch up from there. I truly feel like that moment was a horseshoe moment. That was a small moment that people can say that I didn't lose the game, but I think it changed the game. I think it completely changed. It changed the confidence of Kirk Cousins. It probably changed mm -hmm. the play calling of KLC because Irv didn't go back in for a while. Like he didn't go back in. It was Johnny Munt and uh and um TJ Hawkinson after that. Right. Like Irv, it took him a while to put Irv back in because he's like, well, crap, we're at the goal line. I got to go three tight ends because shoot, I, I had already called get in there. Like, I, I believe if he didn't have to go back to Irv, he probably never would have went back to Irv. On that play, Justin Jefferson's running the, the shallow, like, goal line play. He always runs, and Kirk gets it to him. I think, like, the first play where he got it to him, it should have been a touchdown, but it wasn't. Um, Because his knee was down. I'm not saying it wasn't, not, not mm -hmm. like, not the right call, but he should have just, I, I wish he'd have kept his feet and pushed through. Um, But when you look at that, when you look at that play call, Three guys ran to Justin Jefferson. The two guys covering Irv both ran to Justin Jefferson as well because they were all scared. Like, man, he's outflanked. The guy chasing him, we got to help out because he's going to kill us. So even in that moment, like, I don't think he truly wanted to go to Irv, but Irv was wide open. And, and that was almost a tough, like, I don't understand where Irv was going. Like, the back of the, you're literally at the back of the end zone. Where are you going? Like, slow down. Just stop. Like, even that was more difficult than it had to be. Like, that was, a, like, I, I really don't get it. I'm like, curve in a little bit. Like, I'm, I'm guessing he had a back in line or something or curl or some type of, like, because Justin Jefferson is coming this way. There's no way Irv's supposed to keep going this way. So I don't know what Irv had, but he just stop. Like, nobody's covering you. Slow down and stop. Make it an easy catch. He made that hard. So I, I, I do feel like that changed the game as well. Are there any other moments you could think of or are you, you know, yeah, what are you well, thinking? Well, how about the other 
you know, missed opportunity to to keep a drive going. The the Jefferson pass back. Yeah. To Cousins. Yeah. So you had the that in conjunction with the way the defense was playing forced you to play from behind because yeah. your your drive stalls when it's seven seven because of the Irv drop. Giants score fourteen seven. Your next drive stalls because of the pass back. And it sounds like they got confused mm-hmm. because on the play before Madison fought across the line. They gave them a first down. Then the expedited review changed it, moved it back behind the line. They already had the trick play called. And then KOC probably should have called timeout, but he said, ah, let's just go with it. Mm -hmm. And they went with it and it failed. They lost yardage. They couldn't even go for it if they wanted to. Um, So, and then the giants had it. I think that was the 20 play drive after that. Yep. So at that point, You've had two drives stall out that should have continued, and the Giants, meanwhile, haven't punted. They've they're dominating the time of possession. They're wearing the defense down. They've got a ten point lead, so that that really did you know decide the game. And after that, the Vikings outscored them. Yeah. Um, but when you play from behind by ten, you know as much as the Vikings did this year, eventually you're not going to come all the way back. Yeah, and and so that's that was one of those like it was it was more than not. Eventually, they were going to run into this. They ran out of gas a little bit. Um, I do feel like another movie reference, and I know you don't watch movies, uh, Deadpool. You know, I forgot which. I think it was Deadpool 2 or 3, I think. But, you know, Ryan Reynolds, there's a scene where Ryan Reynolds uh, goes back into time because he has a time machine thing from this guy in the movie, and he shoots himself. (laughs) But it's a joke. He shoots himself when he's reading the Green Lantern uh, script. Because he's saying, basically making a joke about how bad the Green Lantern as a movie was, which total Ryan Reynolds making fun of himself. Uh, But he shoots himself as if to say, don't take this script. Like, just because somebody from Hollywood drops a script on your desk doesn't mean you need to play in the movie. Because it was horrible. It was badly done. Green Lantern's a great concept, but it was badly done. Uh, And so Ryan Reynolds shoots himself. I think Kevin O'Connell should have had a time machine that at the moment, that play you're talking about, I wish there was a Kevin O'Connell that could have went back in time and yanked him like and said hey remember the lions pass play from with dalvin cook don't do it call a timeout <laughs> like i wish there was that like i wish deadpool would have like that would have made the the movie scene the like all of a sudden deadpool's on the sideline like could you imagine that like he really came back in time deadpool is on the sideline ryan reynolds and he like slices the communication thing with Kevin O'Connell to where he has to call a timeout because he's like, hey, our communication's not working. Timeout, timeout. And then Ryan Reynolds disappears into the crowd. And then Kevin O'Connell calls a timeout. He says, hey guys, let's not do this trick play. Let's just it's, let's just run the ball twice. Third and one, let's run the ball twice. Give it to our quarter, you know, give it to our quarterback. Let's push like the Giants do with Daniel Jones. Let them, they know it's coming. So let's make the line long too. So they have to spread out. If they're really, really tight. Just move over a couple, you know, move over a couple spots and go, 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 go find a hole. Do that. Like, that's what I wish he had done. But again, got too cute. It is what it is. So the Vikings are where they are. Uh, my th- uh, quick, quick before we get out to the daily three. Um, Here's my three takeaways, Sam, from this game, too. And, and I always love to do this. Daniel Jones and, and Kirk Cousins, 80% completions for Kirk Cousins, 68% for Daniel Jones, almost 69 uh, 301 yards to 273. Both of them had two touchdowns, 114 pass rating to 112 pass rating. That's you. You we saw two quarterbacks have a really good solid game. Nobody, it was no like Trevor Lawrence, terrible start, having a couple like it was just two quarterbacks having a good game. Now Daniel Jones outed them with the yards rushing. That's where Brian Dable Dable did a great job. He schemed up the runs and just used the fact that his quarterback could run. And he's a poor man's Josh Allen. Like, it worked. TJ Hawkinson, 10 for 129. He is the tight end of the future. I don't know how they can do it. I don't know if they can afford him. He's the tight end of the future. 10 catches for 129. And here's the other one, and we already talked about this. My, my last takeaway was the fourth and eight, it'll be in our minds for all, all offseason. <laughs> like, this is going to be a play that we're going to talk about forever. We're going to keep talking about it. We're going to keep breaking it down. We're going to see everybody else in the world break it down because everybody – Got there, you know, the coach's film is going to be loaded up sometime today or tomorrow, uh, and everybody's going to be talking about it. Everybody's going to want to break it down. We get it. Uh, but, again, I said you can't blame Kirk Cousins. You can't blame Kirk Cousins. You can congratulate him on a great season. Uh, I think he finished top five. We, we That was one of our daily three. Do we think he'll finish in the top five? He did. Um, he found a way to stay up there, even though he didn't play all the Bears game, but he finished in the top five. So, again, 
before we jump into the daily three, that's my three takeaways. Is there anything that you had before we get out of here to the daily three? Uh, not really. I mean, I've got I've got a lot to say, but <laughs> why don't we let, let's spread it out? Yeah, let's. Yeah. We got yeah, so we, much got we got more. We got more because there's a lot of stuff I I, I got to talk about too. We're gonna you know we'll have some films, more film breakdown as it gets maybe Wednesday once the film is loaded Tuesday. I'll be able to look at it and and really pick some key moments, uh, plays, blocking schemes. Um, cause you know, I mean, it, it's one of those things, man, like it, it's tough. Like I'm not, I'm not completely like heartbroken or torn up by this. Like I, it's time to move on to the, the Timberwolves. I, I tweeted it's time to move on to Timberwolves and people are like, no, follow the wild. It's much better. So <laughs> we're going to follow the wild and the Timberwolves. We're going to do both. We're going to, we're going to, you know, do some hockey interviews. We're going to have some basketball interviews, hopefully. Uh, but we're going to, we're going to transition. Like it, it, we're going to stick for bath football through the Super Bowl. So I'm definitely through February, like we got to keep talking football. I mean, we'll definitely hit our local uh conversation of the winter sports, but hey, we got to talk football. We got to talk about the playoffs. We're gonna, I'm gonna watch all the games. We're gonna break down our our players. We're gonna say is is Kirk Cousins better than these quarterbacks still in it? There's a lot of stuff to still talk about, people. Uh, but remember, when you subscribe to Locked On Sports Minnesota, you're getting endless Vikings talk with local experts. Subscribe to the free Locked On Sports Minnesota podcast feed wherever you find your podcast. And you can find all of our videos on Locked On Sports Minnesota's YouTube channel. We have a word from our sponsors. Thanks, Ron. Built Bar is revolutionizing nutrition with their amazing flavors and amazing macros. Built Bar does not compromise any taste, but they're good and good for you. 130 calories, 4 grams of sugar, but 17 grams of protein to fuel you and doing it with unbelievable flavors like churro, peanut butter brownie, coconut almond, cookies and cream, double chocolate. Uh, tastes unbelievable and still good for you and very accessible. You can order them online at built.com, promo code LOCKDOWN15. Get them in store. Go to Walmart, go to Sam's Club, get the four bar box, get the 13 bar box and fill up on some built bars. A great way to help your nutrition with these New Year's resolutions everybody's doing. Built bar, get them at Walmart or Sam's Club. It is a great snack, a delicious treat, and it's good for you as well. Built bar. Well, it's time for the daily three. That's three questions, three minutes each. Take it away, Sam. I've got off-season talkers for you, Ron. We'll start okay. turning the page. As much as we don't want to do it, we'll start talking off-season. Three primers to kind of get you set for the next couple months. So number one, which pricey Vikings veteran? So someone who's got like an eight-figure <sighs> contract. A lot of talk about cutting these guys loose. Who would you absolutely want to retain next year? Who do you want back for sure? Ooh. So if I am going to have to pick somebody that i want the vikings to keep hmm. they have to keep I, I i truly believe like i think harrison smith um i i do feel like because like lewis seen we don't know how he's going to come out of injury uh cam bynum definitely has proved he can be a starter in his league but i think he has a ways to go as far as learning uh kind of how anthony uh um uh what was his name anthony Harris Harris learn from Harrison Smith. Uh, I think Cam Bynum is on that trajectory, uh, but he's definitely going to need him. I think that's a veteran guy on the back end. You need to bring back. Like that's the one, in my opinion, that Harrison Smith has to be back here. Um, I think, and again, if I had to go uh, like of the group, I'd say the one they probably could do without, and this is tough to say, but I, I do truly believe the way this offense is going is Dalvin cook. Like, I think they could do without Dalvin cook just because they don't run the ball enough. Like, I think the the 60 yards, I think Alexander Madison could get you 60 yards. Like the amount of carries he got. Now, I don't know as far as in the past game, but I, I feel like like Alexander Madison in space, when you give him screens, he makes stuff happen. So, I mean, the way the money is going, I just don't feel like you run the ball enough to have like a – you're not the, the 49ers. You're, you're not the – you know, like you're not running the ball like some of those teams that run the ball that way. Like look at Tom Brady. He just – Whatever running back can come for cheap, come on, and I'm going to make you work because I'm going to throw the ball, but I'm going to give it to you every once in a while when I have to. So I, I just truly feel I feel like there's a veteran running back out there I'm pretty sure that would come in for a million bucks and play on this team. What do you think? Yeah, I think – so the answer to my question, who do I want back of sort of the guys on the chopping block? I think Daniil. Mm. Um, I think the contract remains fair uh, for him. It's not, he's not overly pricey for someone of his caliber talent. He was definitely 
the square peg round hole like you talked about. I think mm-hmm. he had a tough time adjusting, but kind of put it together toward the end of the year and was super impactful late. Um, he's only 28. He's not he's not on the wrong side of 30. I think he still has good years left. So I would keep that defensive line strong, bring back Daniil, mm-hmm. and then I'm a little less attached to like guys like Dalvin Kendricks, uh, Harrison Smith, Adam Thielen, uh, but obviously some tough decisions to make. How about this one, Ron, for number mm-hmm. two? Uh, which free agent would you like to re-sign? So I'll read some off to you because there's a mm-hmm. lot of them. Hard to keep track. Patrick Peterson, mm-hmm. Garrett Bradbury, Chandon Sullivan, Irv Smith Jr., uh, Greg Joseph, Alexander Madison. There's a, there's a good six right there who I think are, are pretty notable. Who would yeah. you like to re-sign? Uh, I for sure would like to re-sign Greg Joseph. I think he's proven, um, you know, he can be a valuable asset to this team as a kicker. Um, looking at his uh, salary, I don't think he's going to require a ton as a kicker. Um, I think Jan Sullivan is a corner. I think he proved he was a pretty good nickel, I think, in the system. Uh, I think they need to run more two-man. And so because of that, too, that's why I think Patrick Peterson can get it done for another year. Like, I'm going to go with those guys, like Greg Joseph, uh, Patrick Peterson, and Shannon Sullivan, just off quick. Um, the only reason I'm not saying Garrett Bradbury is I do feel like John Michael Schmidt could be a first round pick the Vikings could take. Mm. Um, now I don't yeah, know how his leg is. Yeah. I don't know how his leg is going to hold up. I don't know, but I do know, um, watching him for the last couple of years, he's really good. Like he moves well in space. He fits the passing type of mold, the, the RPO center that has to hike and then move forward a little bit and then release. Like he fits all the things that I think KLC wants to get to. Uh, where he was always questioning Garrett Bradbury and had to force him to be the guy. Um, but yeah, I'm going to go Patrick Peterson, Greg Joseph, and Shannon Sullivan. Just And Shannon Sullivan and Patrick Peterson are kind of because I think they need to go more two-man. And that's why I say Harrison Smith. Because if you go two-man, you're just you're doing what a lot of teams did to you. You're covering the top receivers with man press, but then you're giving them tons of help. You're not leaving them out to dry where they're pointing and uh, you're, he's open, why aren't you covering him? Always trail and chase and then always have a guy over the top. I think that's what the Giants did, and the Vikings could not figure it out until it was too late. So, yeah. What about you? Yeah. I left somebody off the list I gave you um, that I'm I'm actually going to steal. So, I'm going to say Duke Shelley. How about that? Duke Shelley was was legit, Ron. Yeah, he he was. He passed Cam Dantzler in the the depth chart. I thought he was legitimately good. I don't think this was a flash in the pan. He's only 26, and I I think he's a bargain. Like, I I don't think he's going to command – top dollar or even like medium dollar i still think i think you could get him like three years 12 million dollars nine million dollars and and i think he could be part of your your rotation maybe he has to battle for a spot but that's someone i'd like to have on my team um he's not too old he's not too expensive and you need bodies at cornerback i'm going i'm re-signing duke shelley i'm calling Hmm. it i think he is a like one of the three most important free agents how's that for a hot take yeah, I was looking at the free agent tracker, and that's why I didn't even see Duke Shelley on there. Spot um, track didn't have him. What, yeah, are you on Spot Track? Yeah, yeah, that was weird. But when you look at it, and uh, but when you go to his name himself, I just don't think they have him on the Vikings roster. Yeah, because when you go to hit when you click his name himself, it does say unrestricted free agent in 2023. <laughs> um, so maybe they just didn't have him at all. But he will be age 27. Um, that's funny. Yeah, they don't have him on the Vikings list, so maybe because of how he was put on the Vikings team, mm-hmm. uh, they just didn't have him on there. But yeah, no. Uh, in year one, he he was able to get up to nine hundred sixty five thousand dollars. So yeah, he's not gonna he's not gonna require a ton. And yeah, I think he I think he earned a spot to be, if not a starter, like a, definitely a piece of this puzzle. That if somebody gets hurt, uh, or when you're looking at rotational cornerback, having a guy in there, dude shows us a guy. All right, what you got yeah. next? Uh, last one for the daily three. Will the Vikings be favored to win the NFC North next year, Ron? Yes. Yes. No, yes. Yes. no okay. question. Um, I, I, well, I, I, this is where I go with this. Yes, because I still feel like the Packers are going to be in turmoil all offseason because Aaron Rodgers said it stings and he wants to wait and blah, blah. So I think it depends on where he falls in the pecking order, but I don't feel like the Lions um, are, are going to, I feel like the Lions are going to be middle of the road. Um, I, I just it's just it's just the curse of the Lions. I don't know. Uh, I think the Bears have a lot to figure out if they decide to go elsewhere fields. I think they're going to make a huge mistake. Um, and I'm 
banking on the fact that they will make that mistake. Um, and I just think the Vikings offense is pretty much it's set. So it's set the way it should be. It's set the way it can, you know, they can make some noise. So no, I, I definitely think they're going to be favored to win. Um, the question mark is going to be the draft picks. They don't have a ton. Uh, who are they going to be able to bring in to help out the pieces of the puzzle? But again, I think mm -hmm. if there's a team looking for a running back like the Raiders and some of these other teams like Dalvin Cook will bring you a pretty penny. Like teams will, he, he showed he can be healthy the entire season. So yeah, I think they will be favored. I think, I think favored, but barely. Um, I just think that with the Lions momentum, the Lions are going to be right there with them. Mm -hmm. And if the Packers have Rodgers, I think they still just have a lot of respect. Like I, I think yeah. it, it, it might almost be even like plus 200 for all three of those teams. And then the bears probably at like, uh, and I'm sorry, minus no. Yeah. Plus 200. And then the bears would be like plus, you know, 500. Um, but Depends I think how much ayahuasca he takes too. I think that's going to help. Yeah. Yeah. So is it more <laughs> ayahuasca? They're more likely to win or less ayahuasca because uh, ayahuasca didn't work very well for him. No, year. but I think the ayahuasca is probably going to bring him back. Like, I think that, you know, he, 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 cause he said like money is energy, which that was definitely something he learned when he was on the trip. Um, like you don't just come out and say money is energy as if like, it's a thing. Like he said it, like it was fact, like, Cause they were like, would you be willing to walk away with this? He's like, well, money is energy. And like, didn't like, didn't break a smile or nothing. Just kept talking. I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> this yeah, dude was, never he heard was, that phrase before, but all right. Yeah. He was tripping. I mean, I get it. Cause my guess is the way he probably saw it is money can give you energy and it can also be draining as well. Like, you know, meaning like a lot of money sometimes can take energy away from you because, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it just, it, it forces you into situations you probably wouldn't be in if you didn't have the money. You know, I don't know. I have no idea. Or maybe, you know, the negotiating of the money. Like, I have no idea where he was going with that. But he just said money is energy as if it's fact. Like, the sky is blue. So when the sun comes up, it makes it like, what? Like, the yellow sun and the blue sky make it green. So, it, like, what are you talking about? Money is energy? But anyway. So, yeah, I, I do think they'll be, they'll be favored. Um, but that'll do it for us today on the Ron Johnson Show. Please stick around all week. We got some good stuff we're going to talk about. Friday, though, for the round table and Sam, we were close. That cousin's 275 plus. He was at 273. Like, what the heck? I gotta we, crunch those numbers and see how see how I did. We just need it. Yeah, we're gonna save that for Friday. We're gonna save it for the fans. I'll I'll text you guys probably, but we'll save it for the fans for Friday, how we okay. did on our over-unders. But 275 plus yards, he literally was at 273, Sam. I, mean, I need to go back and watch the film. I feel like they cheated us out of two yards somewhere. Yeah. Like Jefferson's touchdown is probably a yard there. There's one. Yep. And then I'm guessing Hawkinson. Uh, you Hawkinson know, they, had a spot changed on him, remember? He got yeah. the first down that they moved. Yep. That's and it. And they moved it back. There it is, 275. Um, but also in that last play, you know, they said his momentum was stopped. I don't know if it was. Like, I think he had got the ball out. So that was like, give him another yard there. They cheated us 273. So that's one of the prop bets. We'll talk about the rest of them later in the week on the round table. But I'm Ron Johnson. That's Sam Ekstrom. I want to thank you guys for joining us today on the Ron Johnson show. And please make sure you continue to subscribe to the Locked On Sports Minnesota podcast network on YouTube. If you want Vikings, uh, endless Vikings talk, you can find all of our videos. You can find all of our shows instant reactions and podcasts after every game the vikings press conferences moving forward there will be other press conferences but we'll be delivering all the biggest news the vikings will have press conferences because as players get moved traded conversations happen there still will be vikings talk uh but like our videos and leave your thoughts in the comment section below thank you and have a great day